Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, Arizona files suit to force a federal voter registration form to adhere to Arizona's voter ID standards. Managers at a local chain of car washes are charged with ID theft and document fraud after a federal immigration raid and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals rules against an Arizona abortion law. The Journalist Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining me tonight are Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Steve Goldstein of KJZZ Radio. Managers and supervisors at over a dozen Danny's Car Wash locations in the Valley face criminal charges after an immigration raid by federal agents. Uh, Jeremy, this was considered somewhat unusual and rather comprehensive. Uh, yeah, this is a pretty massive raid, the biggest we've seen out here in a long time, especially from the feds. And um, this deals with is, um, you know, most of the raids we've seen around here look from local agencies is focused on the workers. They're, they're really going after the people running this organization now. A lot of them are charged with falsifying documents. They are hiring, you know, hundreds of illegal immigrants, fired, fired them, rehired them with fake documents. These are pretty serious charges. And my understanding is I believe the feds are trying to, like, seize a lot of these properties now. Well, and that's the thing, Howie. This wasn't just going in for a raid. Apparently, Danny's allegedly rehired people that were already considered on the list, on the and, fed and, and, list. And I think that's the adding insult to injury, you know, there's no question, look, you're going to go into certain places in this state and you're going to find illegal immigrants, you're going to find undocumented workers. The idea that somehow they were so allegedly stupid to say, well, we like these guys, so we're going to help them with fake social security numbers, fake I-9s, you know, all that kind of stuff, I think that that's part of what got the government's attention. I think the other reason that the government is doing this kind of stuff is having stopped Joe Arpaio from doing them, having taken away his 287G authority, I think they felt, well, we need to show that we're stepping up and doing the kind of employer workplace raids that he was doing. There may be a certain level of arrogance with what Danny's was practicing, but there's also this feeling, I think, that maybe the feds really won't do much because Sheriff Arpaio had been aiming after employees. He hadn't been going after businesses in this sense based on whether the employer sanctions law or whatever it may be. So I think the feeling may have been, you know, maybe we're free and clear here. And what's, what's really the worry at this point? And then ICE, after a two-year investigation, put the hammer down. And that's been, you know, one of the criticism of our employer sanctions law for years is, you know, when we put this in place when Governor Napolitano signed that, it was, you know, we're going after the employers, you know, not the you know, rank-and-file dishwashers and whatnot. And that's really what's been used for since then by, you know, Sheriff Arpaio, by former county attorney Thomas. That was always used for years, and the criticism was, you know, they never really go after the employers. This really is. Not that that's, you know, diffused any of the criticism from uh, activists towards the government on this. And there's one other fact we can't ignore, which is the trying to get comprehensive immigration reform through Congress. And the argument has been, you know, how are we going to, why are we going to do this when we can't even secure our own borders, when we're not even doing the kinds of, of, of employer raids that supposedly the new law is going to do. This proves, and, and I think that Homeland Security at the highest levels probably approved this, this proves that we can do that, so therefore you can trust us to improve uh, uh, um, uh, comprehensive immigration reform. So is ICE sending a message with this particular raid, and is that message being received? I don't know if the message is being received. <laughs> I'm not real optimistic about that. But when we talk about sending a message, Ted, that's where we have to come back to the fact that this was a two-year investigation. So we can go by the fact of the Gang of Eight coming up with the Senate proposal. I think Howie makes a good point. But they weren't making that point two years ago. Mm -hmm. So has ICE really – this illustrates how much we just don't know about what's being investigated. We don't know when – a judge is going to come out with a ruling against Sheriff Arpaio. We, we have no idea. No one gives us clues. We think, well, it's taken them so long. Maybe they're working behind the scenes and actually coming up with a major operation. Well, what's also interesting is if it took two years for this one raid, that suggests, you know, so when are we going to actually start going after the farmers who are knowingly hiring these folks? Well, yeah, and, and again, what the allegations are is, is this is serious stuff. This is, uh, you know, identity theft, identity fraud, mm -hmm. document fraud, the whole nine yards here. This isn't just you happen to hire a bunch of folks who don't have papers. This is, uh, this is criminal action here. Yeah, this isn't just an employee that, you know, didn't bother to use E-Verify because they don't care or don't want to know. These are people who, you know, as you pointed out, are you, you know, the arrogance of it of, mm -hmm. you know, falsifying documents to rehire people when you've already gotten in trouble in the past for hiring undocumented immigrants. Do we know why the <coughs> owner has not been... Uh... Well, 
All I can say about the owner, we don't, we don't know much about him. I mean, Danny Hendon's been a person around town for a long time, but we do know he's given a lot of money to Sheriff Arpaio. That does not, I, I will not make the quid pro quo there, I will not make the connection, but it is something to think about. Okay, because we, we I, and it, on the other side, you could argue, as you mentioned, I think you would use the word stupid, um, but the <laughs> idea, well, allegedly, yeah. allegedly, stupid. allegedly stupid, but maybe uh, you know, managers and supervisors were doing thing that the upper echelon would say, you've got to be kidding me. But then, of course, I, and I don't want the sheriff to be upset with me. Then we come down to the fact of when Dave Hendershot was running things and the sheriff said, I, I didn't know this was happening. Yes, so well, you're either ignorant or you're a bad manager. Well, it seems to, <laughs> seems to have worked in the past. Okay, um, Minuteman versus MCSO deputy out in the, what, 70 some odd miles southeast Near of Gilbert. Phoenix. Yeah. What in the world is going on out there? Well, first of all, we have deputies out there doing their patrols, and apparently it's, it's a major drug corridor in this area of Gila Bend, and they expect to see people out there running drugs. So apparently they did their little flash of their signal in their vehicle to indicate maybe there's a drug deal going on, maybe we can get some people to come out of the woods or the woodwork, and it turned out there were some people who were in the Minutemen or people who feel that the <coughs> militias should be doing more to protect our border. And apparently this one gentleman decided he didn't want to give up his firearm, not believing that the sheriff's deputy was actually a sheriff's deputy. And a great quote from Sheriff Duarpaio, he's lucky he didn't get 30 rounds put into him. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Jerry, this is uh, uh, southwest uh, of Phoenix. I should have said southeast, but southwest of Phoenix. We're that known area out there where all sorts of things have been happening, uh, seem to be happening. But goodness gracious, you've got armed guys to the teeth. Uh, apparently this deputy, was, it was clearly marked that he was law enforcement, and the guy said, prove it. Yeah, I think this guy came out, you know, it was dark, he couldn't really see, so they just heard someone coming and he said, well, it must be a drug smuggler. I'm going to point my rifle at him and we'll figure it out later. And, you know, if you're not a law enforcement officer, you can't actually do that. And mm -hmm. the problem is you have a number of these groups that like to run around in the desert around Gila Bend or in Pinal County and they think they're enforcing the law. And, you know, there's only so far you can go as a civilian. You know, I remember, you know, back in 05 when this, the Minuteman movement first started, you know, a lot of those folks, this was a much different organization. They didn't, you know, pull weapons on people. They, you know, kept on the lookout for, yeah. you know, activity they thought might be illegal, and they called it into the authorities. They didn't engage people. They didn't detain people. And, you know, and some of these folks are a little that's different. that's crucial. Because yeah. and down in Cochise County, where a lot of this started, it was an idea of walkie-talkies, cell phones. Yes, they were armed in case they were attacked. But you don't confront. You don't do that because you don't know who you're going to come up against. And if you're really facing a true drug smuggler, I got news for you. They're better <laughs> armed than you are. Well, and they're not going to wait there to find out and discuss things yeah. and, and have a right. little argument back and forth on whether or not you're <laughs> a law enforcement officer. And there are so many splinter groups now. I think there are people who would probably be alarmed by the idea of having a huge Minuteman militia group. And yet, in the same sense, when we talk about terrorism around the world, and people said, well, the Cold War was easier because we knew Russia was our enemy or what, mm -hmm. our adversary. So in this case, we're not really sure what's going on. Now that you have these little groups, they were th these were three armed guys who can do a lot of damage to themselves or others. Well, I was going to say, I, I had, was under the impression the Minutemen were on their way out or certainly weren't as much of a presence as they once had been, and perhaps they aren't, but that's a pretty serious incident out there in the desert. Well, yeah, I mean, the Minutemen is, like, is in the Minuteman Civil Defense Corps, this large, organized group that you saw, you know, years ago when this first started. But, you know, like you mentioned, there's all these little splinter groups now. Remember, we had, you know, J.T. Reddy, the infamous neo-Nazi, running around Pinal County a few years ago, and you had Sheriff you had you saying, I just want you to get the heck out of my county. We don't want you down here. And I want to follow up something that Howie said about comprehensive immigration reform in regard to the Danny's raids. I think this applies here as well in the sense that here we are in Arizona, one can argue whether we're enlightened or not, but two of our, the two senators are both in the Gang of Eight, Flake and McCain, and yet there are still a lot of groups here who do not want this kind of reform and see illegal immigrants as... Last point on that then. Is, as some have suggested, is the sheriff's office, along with certain politicians in the state, somehow responsible for this kind of activity and this kind of response? Well, I don't think you can hold a law enforcement person responsible for the fact that there are idiots running around the desert with guns. Uh, you know, there were people who would probably blame law enforcement, say if you were out doing your job, they're blaming Border Patrol, they're blaming Customs, they're blaming uh, ICE, you know, saying if you were out doing the job. But the fact is, you've got understaffed, underarmed officers out there doing the best they can against the tide. And we all know what happened after they secured the California border. After they secured the Yuma sector, after they secured Texas, 
Guess what? Right. What does that leave? That leaves the Tucson sector, and that's become the funnel. But last question, last point on this. Not so much blaming law enforcement, but just the, 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 the political rhetoric and the tone. Again, some are suggesting, right. what did you expect? And there is this helplessness, I think, for some people who some of us would label extremists, others would not. This idea that why isn't the government doing more? We can't trust the government to do this, so we'll take the law into our own hands to an extent the way Arizona decided to take the law into its own hands with SB 1070. Okay, let's move on here. Ninth Circuit uh, in action, again, striking down an Arizona law. This is the one that was passed and signed last year regarding abortion funding. and Funding uh, away from... Oh, please help me with this. <laughs> this is a bill the legislature passed in 2012, and that would the, the purpose was to de essentially defund Planned Parenthood, to keep them from getting any government funds. Now, state and federal law both prohibit you know, taxpayer dollars from being used for elective abortions, but that's such a small part of what Planned Parenthood does and they see a lot of Medicaid patients. And so the legislature didn't want any taxpayer dollars going to an organization that performs abortion. You know, earlier this year, a federal court said you can't do that. You can't you know, withhold these federal funds from qualified medical providers. And the Ninth Circuit today, or the other day just said, you know, agreed with that. And they upheld that, and that it, might be the end of it. <laughs> well, I don't think it'll be the end of it because I think you'll always find somebody who wants to agree. Stephen Aiden from the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a Christian law firm, they're always looking for challenges, things to take to the Supreme Court. The argument has been that to the extent that Planned Parenthood gets Medicaid, Title 19 dollars, for family planning, for pap smears, for things like that, it's helping keep the lights on. And the argument that was made by Representative Justin Olson is that is effectively subsidizing their <laughs> abortion services. And so they said, you want to break off a whole separate uh, arm for have abortion, you know, separate offices, separate utility bills, you can do that. And Planned Parenthood said that makes no sense, which is why they sued. The government, which side, the federal government, which sided with, in fact, with Planned Parenthood, said, no, look, federal law says any Medicaid recipients can go to any qualified provider. The state said, well, we decide who's qualified, and the federal government said, excuse me, you do know we're picking up 90% of the family right. planning yeah. funds, and what part of the golden rule of he who has the gold makes the rules do you not understand? Yeah, the bottom line is state saying that, you know, we, we decide who's qualified, and the feds just basically, no, you don't. Yeah, exactly. That's absolutely what it came down to. And this is, I see this as an uphill climb, but one that isn't going to end anytime soon, because we're going to keep getting legislation related to abortion. And Howie mentioned this idea of having Planned Parenthood break off. Many lawmakers see that as a way for, oh, well, this part of Planned Parenthood is okay, this part is not, we'll focus on that one. But, Jeremy, it, it, again, the agreement, if you want to be part of Medicaid, if you want to be part of this, the federal government being part of your, I mean, there are agreements, there are stipulations, uh, you get, I mean, it sounds relatively clear here. Yeah, and I think it probably, at least from the court's perspective, you, in some cases you can have that separate family planning division, I believe they have it in Texas, but... I forget exactly why, but there are some sort of pr procedural or bureaucratic reasons why that could be that was done there, but it can't be done here. But remember, this issue came up uh, during the legislative session, actually during this uh, Medicaid expansion fight after the uh, first federal court ruled against this bill, and people started trying to insert these abortion clauses into it, and they threatened to splinter the coalition the governor was putting together. And you know, the governor looked at this for a few weeks and said, based on this court ruling, there's just nothing we can do here. Last question on this. Does this become something that is a, a focal point in the elections? Uh, I don't see. This is such a small area of the whole abortion debate. I think the larger issue is going to be some of the other things we've got out there. Uh, we've had, obviously, prior regulations, 24-hour rules, uh, ultrasounds. The other lawsuit that we're waiting for to come down from the Ninth Circuit is, can Arizona ban abortions at 20 weeks? And then there's another case also pending, which is, can Arizona ban abortions based on the race or gender of the child? And those are the things that are going to lead to the fights, and those are things people can relate to more than, are you funding Planned Parenthood? Do you think, Steve, that these, all these fights and all this, this consternation here and, and, and the pushing and the pulling and the shoving and the fighting, um, is that going to be a factor next year as far as the vote is concerned? Or does it become so convoluted and so top-heavy <laughs> in this direction, it just drifts away? Boy, Ted, you've really given me the, uh, the Solomonic choice here. Uh, I, I do think it's heavy. I think we're going to see the same people, though, who are interested in this. And we have a lot of people who are, tend to be one-issue voters. And for them, this is mm -hmm. a very passionate vote. For others, I think it becomes, again, 
Are we going to have these social wedge issues? Because many people see it that way. So I, I think it's going to be out there, but it's not going to be as large a mainstream push. Howie, uh, Arizona suing uh, regarding the uh, federal courts. They want uh, to compel the Federal Elections Commission to act regarding this voter ID thing, which we've oh. discussed so many times. Very briefly, the difference between the state voter ID requirements mm -hmm. and the federal postcard. Arizona voters decided in 2004 you have to provide proof of citizenship, and that exists. You go to the state office and you pick up a state form, you do that. Congress authorized the Election Assistance Commission to create a federal form, useful all across the nation, that makes it easier for people to register. And that federal form has only a statement saying, I avow that I am a citizen, I am eligible under penalty of perjury. This, and be, the law requires the states to accept and use that form. Arizona argued, well, we're accepting and using it with the addition of citizenship proof. The U.S. Supreme Court said no. But the court also said, Justice Scalia said, you can go back to the commission and ask them to add that to the form. Well, a couple of problems. There is no commission. There are four members of the commission. There are zero currently there. The executive director and acting executive director said, I'm not making a policy decision like that. So now Tom Horn, with the aid of Ken Bennett, wants to get a judge to order the acting executive director to approve the change, which is going to be real difficult because I don't know that a federal judge is going to tell a federal agency that you have to do it that but way. But even if it's not approved, that again, according to Justice Scalia, is a way for you to come on back and at least we now have a different avenue for this. Because this, while the Supreme Court said no, Scalia right. said no, but let me, let me help you. Right. Usually you don't get that extra option thrown <laughs> in there. But as Howie pointed out, when you have no members of a commission, that puts a little bit of wedge in there. One thing, Ted, just to take us off track slightly, that I'm struck by is that this is also being supported by the Kansas Secretary of State who I think we know pretty well, Chris Kobach yeah. is someone who co-wrote SB 1070 yes. with Russell Pierce, and now Tom Horn is connected with that. Kobach is also arguing there are people in Kansas who have been guilty of voting uh, multiple times without some sort of citizenship but, bank. But, so. but here's the problem in Arizona. The evidence that the state presented in trying to uphold this is that 200 people registered who shouldn't have been there, and they were found by through the jury pool questionnaires that, yeah, you're registered to vote, you must be a citizen. Oh, I'm not a citizen, you don't call me for the jury pool. Well, the fact is, none of these people used the federal form because the federal form wasn't being accepted at the time. The closest thing we have to evidence of a problem is the Secretary of State's office found three instances where people use an Arizona driver's license is only available to non-citizens to try to register to vote. They never got registered, they certainly didn't vote. And so that becomes the question of, oh, do we have a, a lawsuit in search of a problem here? Which, and this is the argument here on every one of these voter integrity laws, uh, you know, as the Republicans like to refer to them all across the country, is say we're fighting voter fraud. And the counter argument is there are so few real examples of this ever happening that, like you said, it certainly seems like a you know, solution in search of a problem. And of course, the counter argument is that what this really does, the people this stops from voting who are allowed to vote but can't are primarily Democratic well, voters, uh, elderly, um, minorities, naturalized citizens, low-income voters. Well, understand why groups like the federal form, because if, in fact, you register with the, with the state form, you have to have some uh, a photocopy of your naturalization papers or something, you're going out and you're registering people on the street. Federal form makes more sense, where you just avow to it, you put in your last four, your Social Security number, and so it makes voter registration drives easier. Guess who they go after? Minorities, Democrats, and that's why Republicans don't like it. And the last point on the Supreme Court basically said the intent of the motive, the, the intent of this federal form is to make it easier. Mm -hmm. That's the idea mm -hmm. behind this, and what Arizona's law does goes against the intent. Well, exactly. That's exactly what they're saying. And I think what we have now, and, and I think Jeremy and Howie pointed it up brilliantly, is we come down to this is what it comes down to. This is in a matter of is there voter fraud or is there voter suppression? A lot of people would say there really isn't much of either. Yeah. So this is another political point. Let's get our sides going and amped up. All right, speaking of, of politics, can anyone explain the clemency board and who these people are and why they were there and why they're not there anymore? Uh, I mean, it sounds like peop what is going on, Howie? Well, to start off with your threshold question, um, clemency board does exactly what you suggest. In other words, they get reviews, requests from, from inmates to be released early, be pardoned, or, or, or have uh, you know, part of their sentence uh, done away with. It used to be they had a lot more, more power. It used to be the governor had a lot more power. Now you've got this whole procedure. What happened is we had uh, Jesse Hernandez um, 
who was appointed by the governor, who apparently ran into some problems. Um, at the very least, he may have been dating a staffer, uh, and we now come to find out that he had developed a personal relationship with Amari Stoudemire, who had a relative who had a case before the board. Um, and so this has been bleeding out very slowly. The governor's office, uh, unfortunately, rather than laying it all out there, making a one-day story, has let this thing bleed. And not only that, but another member of the board left because he wasn't happy with what he saw Hernandez doing and treating others. You should mention that person allegedly mm -hmm. dating also allegedly got a $21,000 pay raise. Yes. So, uh, and, and, and that's the problem. And, and you have so many of these little boards and commissions, and Jeremy sees a lot of this, you know, Nature of the Capital Times, that you don't, can't keep track of what everyone is doing and you're bound to have some problems, but it's, on occasion it, it comes to the surface. And it's ironic that you could have these this kinds of level of problems on a board that uh, where the job seems pretty easy. You know, you give, it's supposed to, you know, approve or disapprove clemency. But you know, Governor Brewer is very well known for you know not giving a lot of clemency. I think she's probably given less, to, given it to fewer inmates than most of her predecessors. She actually Hernandez was actually a replacement when she got rid of three people a couple of years ago because they didn't really, you know, they disagreed on this point that. Uh, he was basically brought in to not give clemency. Well, to he a was lot of brought people. in because he's got Republican ties. Yeah. It's eighty-four thousand dollar a year job for this. I mean, hello. Well, he was brought in, but Steve, did he have much in the way of experience along these? No, no, no he did not. And, th and this is where I, I would give Jesse Hernandez the hubris award of the week if Arizona Horizon has that ten, which is that he said he was asked to resign for political reasons. Mm -hmm. You got the position for political reasons. Yeah. So, well, yes, you take one, get the other. All right. Um, so now we have two openings. Howie, you got any free time for the clemency board? Well, let's see. If it's 84000 just for, for hanging around just for a couple of meetings a week, yeah. uh, not, not a bad deal. All right. Uh, Don Shooter uh, says, okay, uh, what, where do I sign? It sounds like he didn't even read the agreement. He's, he's, he's agreed to defer prosecute. What's, what's happening here? Yeah, this, the school incident in Yuma. The saga, if not over, it's at least on hold and potentially over for a while. Yeah, uh, you know, Senator Don Shooter down in Yuma, who was accused of bursting into his grandson's uh, classroom down in Yuma and you know, yelling at a teacher. He was angry. He believed that his grandson was being bullied. He got charged with trespassing, with disrupting a school. And this finally got resolved today where they just said, pay a fine you know, to the school, pay a fine to the prosecutor's office, and don't commit any crimes for the next year, and we're going to let this all slide. The charges it, will be dropped. Yeah, and that's, it, it's not unusual. You find this actually with a lot of uh, marijuana cases. It's called the deferred prosecution where we essentially say, look, um, the charge is still sort of out there. We are going to hold it in abeyance for one year. If you keep your nose clean and don't do anything stupid, which given these people are lawmakers, we'll, we'll find out. But well, if you don't do anything stupid in the next year, the, the charge will be dismissed with prejudice. Well, I'm intrigued. I'm, I wish Ron Gould would run for Senate again so we could actually have a Senate Ethics Committee hearing on this, but I guess we're probably not going to see are that. Are we going to see a Senate Ethics Committee hearing on any of this now that the whole thing has been deferred? Uh, it's hard to say. We haven't really heard anything on that, at least today, you know, and who knows what will shake out next week. Some people might push for it, Democrats at least might push for it, because Senator Shooter is a Republican and a, you know, fairly prominent one at that. But, um, I mean, the fact that he paid this fine, that he kind of got a slap on the wrist, it might uh, kind of dissuade people from doing that. Or it might make pe some people say, well, maybe he didn't get enough. Let's try our hand at it. Does Senator Shooter stay a fairly prominent Republican? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't see any reason why the leadership would suddenly say, you know, we're going to take you off of the Appropriations Committee. I mean, a lot of this stuff had come out earlier. You know, he's known for being a bit of, of, of how casual. Should say, casual. Uh, I mean, here's a guy who showed up at one point in, in a serape and, and a sombrero with a couple of bottles of tequila. Okay, you know, he's, he's a, 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 a very happy guy. He's a very uh, emotional guy, and I think that's what he's going to say happened is he didn't think his grandson was being treated right, so he went in and the, he let his emotions leave. And, Ted, I don't know if you knew this, but lawmakers only make $24,000 a year, so I guess we you know, take what we can get. All right. With that encouraging <laughs> note, we will say thank you all for joining us this evening. Monday on Arizona Horizon, U.S. Senator Jeff Flake will join us to discuss immigration reform, the Affordable Care Act, and other major issues facing Arizona and the country. Senator Jeff Flake, Monday evening, 5.30 and 10 on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, we'll look at Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio's most recent public approval ratings. Wednesday, we speak with ASU Regents Professor and Arizona's first poet laureate, Alberto Rios. Thursday, a new report by the Morrison Institute looks at income levels in Arizona. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists' Roundtable.
That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.